Uh, my name is Jonathan Wong. Uh, I'm from the Diocese of Singapore. I'm, my primary responsibility is to pastor a, a parish church. Uh, but also in Singapore, um, because we have so much work going on, all of us have multiple hats to wear. So I'm working uh, with the Deanery of Vietnam. I have, the Dean gave me the title Partnership Coordinator because I was coming here to help <laughs> develop partners. Uh, Second yeah. <laughs> so, in any case, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about Vietnam. And I, you know, a lot of times for a lot of Americans, when they think of Southeast Asia, they tend to think of Vietnam because of the legacy of the war. You know, it, everything reported in the news at the time was about Southeast Asia. And so Vietnam is the, the country that's most associated, I think, in a lot of American minds uh, with South, Southeast Asia. And, you know, for better, for worse, uh, uh, there was a journalist that made this quote. He says, the Vietnam War is a wound in some ways that would never heal. In the psyche of the American people, yes, but I think also in the Vietnamese people. You know, sometimes you go and <laughs> they will, it's interesting, I'm not even American and I go for some of these tours and they'll tell me about all these evil Americans and what they did to our country, you know, and, and so it's, it's still there, but that, you know, seems to be dissipating with the generations. And Vietnam is actually a beautiful country. There are a number of you here I know who've been to Vietnam and you will attest to the fact that it is beautiful on many levels. You know, not just in terms of uh, the countryside itself, but the people are beautiful. Vietnam, uh, at last count, is almost 98 million people, one third the size of the United States. But the country itself is the same size as the state of Florida. So you can imagine it's, you know, people are packed in there. Uh, and, uh, but they're predominantly a young population with about 60% below the age of 40. And um, uh, as with a lot of these countries in Southeast Asia, only 1.8% are evangelical uh, Christians, about 8% uh, Roman Catholics. But the Roman Catholics, uh, a lot of them tend to be more uh, a legacy. They've grown up Roman Catholics. They've, the, when the uh, communists came in and took over, the Roman Catholic Church continued and um, so, you know, they, they managed to keep their numbers uh, through that time. But a lot of Christians had left and, you know, it's still a very small presence. But, you know, we thank God that um, really, I believe God's on the move. But if you think about these numbers, it seems like a huge task, just as it is uh, with Thailand. But, you know, there's an even larger population. There is a saying, isn't there? How do you eat an elephant? <laughs> and the answer is one a bite at a time. How do you win a country to Christ? One person. one person at a time. Let me tell you a story, and you'll see the picture in one of our brochures. So, of a young couple, Thai and Nok. In uh, 1989, life was not going well for them in Vietnam. He was a government worker, she was a teacher. They had a young son, and they were finding a lot of difficulty to make ends meet. So at that time, you know, there were a lot of people, because of the economic situation, decided to get on a boat and find their way out of the country. You remember the era of the boat people. This couple, uh, uh, one of them, it was a hazardous journey. He was telling me. You know, he wished he never did it because once they were on the high seas, they realized they could have lost their lives so easily. The two of them, plus 49 other people, made landfall on May 28, 1989. It's only when they got to Hong Kong, uh, they made landfall in Hong Kong, they discovered that uh, countries all around the world had changed their policy. Up till 1988, you know, uh, Australia, the UK, the US, would take all these boat people and resettle them in their countries. But by 1989, they had stopped that. So they landed there and they were told, you're going to be put into this detention camp and then you're going to be repatriated to Vietnam. He tells a story of how fear gripped his heart. He was a Communist Party member. He was you know, a government worker. If he goes back, how is he going to be treated? 
you know, the, the fear of, of repercussions was very high, not just for him, for his family. He left his four-year-old son in the care of his parents. And they lived a very hard life in that uh, refugee camp. Uh, conditions of Spartan Joni <laughs> actually worked in that very uh, camp. She, she'll tell you it was not a pleasant place to be. Yeah. Well, they made a, a life for themselves. They started teaching because that was uh, Nock's um, previous profession. And they taught the kids. And eventually she became the principal of the school in that camp. Well, the, because the, the schools were set up by missionaries and by um, um, the UN, you know, the missionaries wanted to come in and hold services, so that was the facility they used. So every Sunday they would have church services in uh, uh, that space, and um, uh, Tai and Ngok had to take care of the place, not just teach the students, but were also responsible for keeping it clean. And he was telling the story of how, you know, after they finished, they left a mess, all the Christians. And he was very, uh, it's not the Christians, but the people who would come to the, the church itself. And he, in his mind, he had doubts, you know, because they were handing out food, handing out clothes. You know, these people are coming just uh, to get these things. So he didn't have a very good impression about uh, Christians until one day, uh, a set of missionaries came in and his boss told him that uh, these missionaries were to teach the lesson for the children. And the lesson they chose to teach was the lesson of the lost sheep. And he remembered that you, it, it struck him for some reason or other, I'm that lost sheep. <laughs> you know, how you get lost because you're stupid or you're wandering and you just can't find your way. And you know, it reflected on his life. And he began thinking about it. And in the meantime, he began to befriend a missionary. And you know, this missionary began to share the gospel with him and with his wife. And, you know, it, it came to pass that the sharing told him that there is a good shepherd who finds all these lost sheep and brings them home. And he and his wife eventually were baptized in that camp. In 1994, he returned to Vietnam, and it wasn't an easy life. <laughs> he didn't get punished in the way he had feared, but economically it wasn't much better. And it was a hard uh, life, but you know, because of his faith, because of what God had done in his life, he finally uh, decided to serve the Lord uh, uh, full time and became a pastor. And he's now the pastor of our church in Hanoi. And I'm going to show you a video and they share both him and his wife will talk about the ministry that's there. Then I'll uh, carry on and, and give you uh, more. For last uh, seven, eight years, I can see the law is doing a great thing in Vietnam and especially in this city, Hanoi. Uh, many people are more open to the gospel now. More and more churches are planted and we try to do the social work to reach out to, to the community. I am Rebecca Pham the principal of Abani Center in Hanoi, Vietnam. We reach out to local school and community by organizing English festival and uh, Christmas celebrations. We are setting up a homeschooling program using Asala Rated Christian Education Curriculum. Our vision is to share gospel of Christ and to disciple the young people to become the influential leaders for church and for Vietnam. We have two mornings that we start with devotions. So the whole school comes together and Pastor Jacob um, gives a short devotion and uh, the children will go back to their classes uh, where they will do their work uh, because this work that they're doing is individualized. So they will be at their offices and doing their work and we facilitate if they should uh, meet any problems or if they need help. So they were baptized as Jacob and Rebecca. 
And this is the story of, uh, you know, how their lives were transformed because someone and some people took the time to work in refugee camps. Sometimes I know those who work in such places, you wonder, is there any fruit? Because you don't see where they go after, and what becomes of them, and you know. So this is really a, a testimony to, to the fact that the one life you've impacted has made tremendous uh, a change in the climate of, of that country because he's become, uh, you know, quite an important person in terms of the work for the Anglican Church, but certainly he's the, the government even consults him about Christianity. He goes to give lectures on uh, Christian doctrine so that he can educate them because they deal, the religious affairs departments have to deal with other Christians and sometimes they're puzzled, why is this denomination different from this denomination? And then he, he has to instruct them on that. But talking about openness, 2017, uh, I accompanied the bishop and the dean and we were going for a confirmation service. We go once a year uh, to confirm uh, uh, new Anglicans, new members, recently baptized, uh, mostly adults. And uh, very often uh, we go and spend time. But in 2017, in December, Franklin Graham had a Love Hanoi Festival. Franklin, of course, is the son of the great Billy Graham. And we had the privilege of sitting there. You can't see, but I was sitting right up there. <laughs> Take my word for it. <laughs> but it was amazing because it was done in full, with full permission from the uh, government. And, um, you know, the government in their own way, they tried to limit it. So they applied for a large uh, stadium, outdoor stadium, which would seat 50,000. The government said, no, you can use this one, which sits about 8,000, and it's an indoor enclosed stadium. But they had uh, large grounds. So they set up big screens with, you know, uh, uh, loudspeakers, and there were 25,000 each night, two nights. Really? So a total of 50,000. They bust 400 uh, people in from, uh, from all around. Uh, Hanoi in, in the outer provinces, 400 buses. And what was amazing was that there were thousands of people. This is at the invitation. You can see the whole floor is just filled with people who came forward, you know. And even outside, uh, I, I, one of um, our team went outside to see people gathered in front of the screens. <laughs> and we were told not only were the people inside, you know, the government didn't realize because once they set up outside, the sound system was also blaring into the neighborhood. <laughs> The taxi drivers who were waiting for their fares were wrapped in attention, listening to the message. You know, the shopkeepers around were listening. You know, so there was such a tremendous uh, outpouring. But not only that, what we saw, this is the outside. You can see that's the indoor of the stadium. And there were areas here and there were screens down there. So there were, you know, uh, over 25,000 each night who, who got a chance to hear the gospel. But also the church was united in a way it had never been before. Mm -hmm. You know, she's done studies uh, on the, the, the um, situation in the church and she will tell you that in the past especially, the, the, the Protestants wouldn't <laughs> work well with each other. Mm -hmm. But you know, this, in this case, all the churches came together in the Hanoi area, which was unprecedented, you know, and, and shared with each other and contributed to each other's work. So much so that um, we found one of the Tinlan churches now helps us uh, in getting registration and you know speaks to the government on our behalf, which is something which has never happened before. But also there's a real openness amongst the people. And I believe that this is the time the Lord has laid out for us to really go in and, and, and uh, do something. Rebecca was telling me at the end of this, when she was driving us to the airport, that 12 years ago, she had this uh, vision or dream she couldn't really say, but you know, something from the Lord of how a revival was going to break out in the north and then spread out throughout the country. Now, you understand this is not something that she would have dreamt up herself because if you know Vietnam, actually Christianity is stronger in the south because of its legacy in the past. There's much greater Christian presence in the south. And you know, if you were humanly speaking, you would think it'll start in the south and then break out to the rest of Vietnam. You know, the North, because of its communist roots and all that, it's always been a, a, a smaller and weaker church. But what we've seen there, I believe, is really a beginning of what God is about to do. I've got a <laughs> limit to how much I can share. So I just want to tell you what we would like to ask you to do. 
and this actually sums up uh, the ways in which you can be involved. But very quickly, I think the first and the most important thing we ask of you is to pray. You know, there is still a war going on in Vietnam. But it's not a war against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers, against forces of darkness that are over that land. And you, we would cherish and treasure your prayers, you know, to, to pray for the work in Vietnam, not just for our work as Anglicans, but for all uh, the churches, for the gospel to take root in that land. You know, I think it is really a, 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 a right for the gospel right now. And let's make, uh, um, while it is still day, do the work that the Lord has called us to. But also, you know, those of you who uh, teach, it's a wonderful opportunity to come and to teach. You can come and uh, teach as an English teacher. That's, as was said before, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, that is open. People all want to learn English and they are very interested in practicing their English. I was sharing with some of you and you remember this. You know, uh, I uh, have good command of English. In fact, English is the only language I really speak. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up speaking English. But if one of you in this room was to stand beside me and, you know, you ask the classroom, which teacher do you want to teach you? They would automatically point to you because they assume you are a native English speaker. Yeah, because of where you are from. Uh, because I'm from Singapore, they would say, yeah, maybe you learnt it as a second language. It would be their assumption. You know, so there's a tremendous opportunity. This is Lucy Gray who came, spent five months uh, from uh, USPG UK. She was uh, taking a gap year in the university and she came and she spent uh, uh, five months just working with the children and teaching. She said, you know, I share the love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ by being loving and caring towards the Vietnamese children, respecting and listening to them. And there are tremendous uh, opportunities and, and ways in which you can impact them by just coming, even in uh, short term. We've had people come for a month, you know, and, and um, in the summer we always have an English summer camp. Actually, that's the other point. We can come to train um, vocational skills or you want to train uh, leaders in discipleship. We are uh, welcoming teams who are willing to do that, speak to us, and we can do it. Or send short-term teams. You're going to recognize some people in this picture, right? <laughs> uh, there they are. <laughs> this is the team from the Falls Church, and they're right here. <laughs> they came to do courses and uh, professional skills. They also helped. You came to Singapore and helped in the English summer camp. You send some people to do that. Every year we bring uh, a group of uh, young people out and they come for two weeks, ten days, something like that. And it's like intensive uh, English camp, just like uh, Thailand does in some ways, but ours are skew younger. The Thais are a bit older. So they, they come and we, we run these camps during the summer, during their summer vacation, which is usually in June. So I think, you know, for some of you, that might be an option also to come and help. Uh, to give the work, of obviously, uh, takes money. But, you know, I uh, added something else which is not there. Because as I was, uh, my last trip to Hanoi was in June. And I was sharing with Pastor Jacob about the fact that I'm coming to New Wineskins. And I said, you know, I'm trying to ask uh, our brothers and sisters in America to help us. He said, what can I ask them uh, to do for us in Vietnam? And they said, you know, be hospitable to foreign students who come from Vietnam. <laughs> Open your homes. Yeah. He explained to me because of the way Vietnamese culture works. Um, you may not understand this, but in their culture, uh, Children are very obedient to their parents. <laughs> yeah, if the father says, you cannot become a Christian, they will say, okay. Father says, throw that Bible away, they will take it and they'll put it in the <laughs> garbage because that's just the way uh, culture is for them. The moment they leave their country, you know, that the freedom that's afforded them to explore new things and to learn new things is, is quite different. And he has found in his experience many people 
have uh, um, discovered the gospel when they've been away. And Vietnam is sending more and more students overseas, especially to the U.S., to do their tertiary education. And we have one of our congregations yeah. from the baptized them. Excellent. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, you know, as you disciple them, and as you ground them in the gospel, they inevitably do come back, you know, because of ties to home, because Vietnam economically is really on the uptake. So there are lots of jobs, lots of opportunities. So many of them will return. Connect them back to us. Because one of the things that happens, I know because I, I spent five years in Canada pastoring a church, and we worked amongst internationals. One of the tragedies, even though we had led them to Christ, we couldn't quite connect them to a church. We, I recommended some people, but we didn't really know them, just sort of talked about, you know, can try this church or that church, but they never really got connected in the community. And years later, to, you know, they, when they come back to visit, we find out that they're not really going to church anymore. So, you know, what we do have in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh, Saigon, the city to the south, are uh, uh, Anglican churches who love to welcome them back and to, you know, incorporate them into the body. So, you know, that's in a nutshell the work in Vietnam. There's a lot more I could talk about, uh, but um, my time is up. <laughs> so I'm supposed to turn the time over to you to ask questions. Yeah. Oh. Um, I've noticed there's a lot of Vietnamese that come over and, and begin nail salons. Hmm. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I guess there's a... <laughs> they're good at it? <laughs> yes. Yes? Uh, my question is about the spiritual condition of Vietnamese people in Vietnam, not yeah. in America. So the Vietnam culture is very much influenced by the culture of China. The China's culture is very much affected by Confucianism. Yes. This part, video piracy aspect you mentioned is an aspect. China was taken over by the Communist Party. Vietnam was taken over by the Communist Party. In China, there's an event called the Cultural Revolution that completely eradicated the influence of Confucianism in Chinese people. Yeah. In other words, children are not necessarily obedient to their parents. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the contributions of Communism and yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> and spiritual conditions. You mentioned that in Vietnam, Northern part communist is more receptive to Christianity than the southern part, which is more influenced by Western culture like French and Americans. This is probably why. Now, in China, the communism created the largest people group of non-religious people in the world, mm -hmm. the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, we now, are young people especially non-religious or they still call them? To About 30% would be uh, registered as non-religious. So it's not as high as in China. 50% are Buddhist. Uh, and then a lot, about 10% are uh, uh, um, ethno-religions. You know, sort of animism that's uh, practiced in, in the country. Can you say that percentage again? Can you say that percentage again? So 30 About 30% would be non-religious. Yeah. Are they mainly on the north? Um, I don't know the distribution, I just know the total sum, the numbers for the country itself. And But in my experience in actually talking to them, they aren't, uh, uh, it, they didn't go through a cultural revolution in the first I know, place. I know, there's no culture. And so, and, and I think communism was not as much of an ideology in Vietnam as it was in China. You know, it wasn't pushed as hard as an ideology, it was a means by which they could liberate themselves from what they thought were foreign invaders. You know, and that's that, there, there's a difference, I feel, uh, between the communism of Vietnam and the communism uh, you find in a place like uh, China, for example. Okay. Yeah, but that's... So Buddhist is still the largest you know, uh, people group in Vietnam? Buddhist. Buddhist, yes. Uh, half, half the percent, about 52% are Buddhist. Theravanda Buddhist? Yes. Okay. Mahayana. Oh, Mahayana, sorry. Could I just clarify? Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of, I'm doing doctoral research right in these areas. Um, actually, only about 13 or 14 percent of people are get into are actually Buddhist. What that means is you go to the temple and you register yourself. Some of them will say, I'm Buddhist, because they have practiced Buddhist practice, but they're not really Buddhist. 
That means, well, maybe once in a while they go to the temple, or when somebody dies, they call the monks in, but they're not really Buddhists. They really are animals. Yeah. But I believe, from my study, that they really, truly are filial pietists. Mm. And they can discard, you cannot worship Kuan Yin or all those. Nobody cares if you worship Buddha or Kuan Yin, that's the language of Buddha. You know? mm. Although they don't care. But you must be a filial pietist. That is absolutely been wrong for them. And so as someone, I'll give this person actually, I've quoted him, he said, I guess we really are ancestor worshippers. That's our religion. Yeah. So if you go down to the bedrock, but they are ancestors. And that's true uh, so across the board. Yeah. Or they just respect ancestors. There's a difference. <laughs> no, they. Uh, <laughs> most of them. That's only another dark old I, I believe, but I only studied in the South. Uh-huh. I believe, but only they only really respect. But sometimes they do talk to dead people. They will mm-hmm. talk to their ancestors like it's there, but then they go, where are they really? They don't, I don't know. They, it's kind of a, in their mind. It's yeah. kind of just vague. But the filial piety is so important that you must show respect. Mm-hmm. And you can actually use that as a bridge for the gospel. Mm. I'm going to eventually bring that out. Yeah. I believe you can use it as a bridge for the gospel. Mm. Yeah. Oh. So, Sorry. Go ahead. It's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> I need to I, I, I take a question. Yeah. But to highlight the importance of an individual uh, who helps Vietnamese people, Google says that Tippi Hedren, the actress, <laughs> visited a bunch of uh, Vietnamese ladies mm-hmm. in a Sacramento um, uh, refugee camp. They loved her nails. She asked them how they could help. She got a bunch of them started in the nail salon. <laughs> <laughs> they undercut the prices of everyone else in Southern California, and now 80% of uh, Southern California nail salons are run by the So there you go. It's Tippi Hedren. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Scott has this mind. I've known him for many years. He has this mind for trivia, which is like beyond. <laughs> Make a difference. Right. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Is there, so you've mentioned like Hanoi and, and Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. 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 Is there like a desire to see, I think I saw this somewhere, like a desire to see churches in other cities? Oh, yes. And, like what would the kind of process by which that, like our leaders being raised up, where, how? That is one of the crying needs right now uh, to raise leaders, younger leaders. Um, both Thai and Chi, who's the uh, clergyman in the south, are. Um, Pai is 58, 59. He's, uh, Chi is already 62. Uh, our diocese, we retire our clergyman at 65. So um, it, there's a real need to, to do uh, um, leadership renewal. And um, as I talk with them and I've, I've worked with them, it's the same, I think, in Singapore and the same here in the US. The cares of life. The pursuit of a career, you know, it's kind of hard. Uh, they find they're really great as youth. They go to the university and then they start working, mm. and then something changes at that point, <laughs> you know, because you 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 begin this trajectory and you're trying to establish yourself in life, and that that's you know not unfamiliar to all of us, you know. So it's it's a, it's a real issue and need, and I think you know it does boil down at the end of the day to discipleship. A lot of the talks we've heard here, you know, is when people really get connected to the Lord <laughs> and the relationship is real, you know, obedience just follows. <laughs> and I think that, that is that's a crying need uh, for all of us, uh, our churches, including the churches in Vietnam. You know, and I think that I, 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 when I work with the young people, there's so much potential, very, very bright people. And I, I, you don't want to stereotype, <laughs> but I find that Vietnamese are very entrepreneurial. <laughs> they are very brave to go out and try things and do things, you know, and they they, 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 they love to start businesses and, and, and I want to take that and turn it for the gospel, you know, <laughs> have a passion to pioneer new works. And I think there's so much potential in, in there because we, we have in both churches a good group of uh, young uh, adults who I think, you know, if someone can really get them and influence them and really turn them on for the Lord there's so much potential because ultimately church planting does come down to the church planter those of you who have been involved in church planting know that and we want to be able to train church planters and you know if any of you want to come and help we are more than willing to uh, uh, talk with you and see what we can uh, uh, work towards 
Yes. Uh, so, I was wondering, <coughs> the big crusades you had, 50,000 people, all the people who came forward, were those people, have those people been like placed in churches? They were, and they were assigned to churches, but you know, this is one of the big problems even Billy Graham's Evangelist Association finds it's hard. The follow up is hard. You know, because people uh, get back and then their parents will say, You did what? You know? <laughs> why did you do that? And then, you know, you, you wonder, Why did I go up front? You know? But uh, based on our experience, like in 1978 in Singapore, Billy Graham came and had tremendous impact. 350,000 people turned up over five, uh, six nights, you know, and I think almost 20,000 people gave uh, their lives to Christ. Less than half remained <laughs> in the church after. But, um, yeah, yeah. When, um, two years ago at a pastor's prayer summit, in Singapore we have pastor's prayer summits, uh, where we get pastors from all denominations we gather at a, a retreat and we pray together for our country. 700 pastors from all over the country uh, would come together. And uh, because uh, in 2018, it was like 40 years from 1978, um, someone asked, how many of you were at the Billy Graham Crusade? Tons of hands went up. How many of you received Christ? And there were like 50, 60 pastors <laughs> whose hands were up. You know, so sometimes you, it's not just the numbers alone. You never know whom the Lord uh, touches. Uh, some of you know uh, uh, Archdeacon Wong Tak Ming. He was one of those <laughs> who put his hand up as a young, you know, 14-year-old uh, boy, 12-year-old boy. I can't remember how old he was at the time. You know, and he, he's now uh, our, one of our senior clergy in the diocese. So we hope and pray the seeds have been sown and we'll see what happens later. I know, I can't speak for the others, but I know those that were assigned to Hanoi, not many stayed, <laughs> you know, and, and unfortunately, uh, they haven't continued yet, but we've not lost contact with them, so it's, it's not altogether lost, all, you know, so we believe the seeds will planted, and hopefully we will see uh, fruit coming out of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Now, could you comment on how open the country is, both in terms of workers, coming in and, and the government allowing them to freely work. Uh, you, you cannot get a Christian workers visa. They will not issue visas for that. Um, I have a friend, a uh, Singaporean, who's been working in uh, Ho Chi Minh the last 15 years and he attends an international church and their pastors are all lay people who've come on business visas and are doing work and then on the weekend they volunteer. You know, because they, they can't get a, 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 a visa for a pastor. So that most of the Christian workers who go in, go in on student visas, uh, they go in on business visas, or they go in on other uh, types of visas, or sometimes social visit passes, and they just come in and out. Maybe, Joni, you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah. it's really pretty easy to get a visa. It's just, it's, there's things they just don't even know, so. Yeah. <laughs> The Vietnamese persons were the best people at debating the system that I've ever met. They were teaching how to do it. They yeah. were good at it. So I got bases for 10 years. Yeah. I, I got one kind of all the time. Yeah. But other than that, that was real early on. I never knew. They, they don't think the same way we do as Americans and as Singaporeans, you know, the, or the law says this, oh, okay, we <laughs> It's malleable. And you discover it. You, you discover it when you try and uh, learn their traffic rules, yeah. which are, <laughs> there are none. Uh, it, my first time there, and I was told, taught how to cross the street. You know, we will wait at a traffic crossing, or we wait until traffic clears. You don't there. You just start walking. <laughs> and you must walk at an even pace so that the, the traffic can predict where you are going to be, and they'll just flow around you. <laughs> and that's a metaphor for how life in Vietnam is. <laughs> You know, you just proceed the way you want to do it, and you just, you know, make your way, <laughs> find your way, yes. What you do with your free time is what you do with your free time. <laughs> but you have to be teaching as well, you know, so you will have... there's more freedom to freely communicate. Yes, yes. It's not illegal to possibly Well, no, they won't put an... 
uh, it, it is illegal, but they haven't. It's a very flexible law. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.